Good morning. Hello. Hey, good morning. Everybody's so talkative and happy. We're not used to sunshine. Man, it is so good to see you all this morning. Happy Easter as we're here celebrating uh, our risen Savior. This is awesome. Uh, it was really, really nice to see that light coming through the window this morning when I woke up. I can tell you that much. I was, I was getting over it. You know, it's bad. Some of you ladies, I'm not blaming all of you, but some of you, specifically my wife, that Easter is an important, I mean, I, you have ulterior motives around Easter because it's the one holiday that you can dress us up like an Easter egg and get away with it. Because normally pastels top and bottom are a hard no at my house, but I do what she says today. So it really is good to see you all. Um, just quick notes for any visitors here, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, the restrooms are located right outside the double doors on the right and the left of the hallways uh, towards the exit doors. Uh, today we're not going to have any elementary, uh, elementary, certain words get me, uh, Grace Kids class today, none of that. Same thing with preschool class, it will be available after music. So parents, after the music, please walk your kids down for the preschool age class. Uh, also, there is no Word of Life youth this afternoon, so don't come. Uh, and then, Ladies of Grace, the spring yard sale is right around the corner. So, please bring us your, your I was going to say junk, but we don't want your junk. Uh, bring the stuff that you think people would actually want. Huh? <laughs> Gently used, yeah, we're going to treat it like a consignment store. You used to take anything to a consignment store. Now they just like, turn everything away. Um, if you have any questions on that, it's Saturday, April the 29th. See Diane or Aaron if you would like to donate any items for that sale. Uh, also, Ladies of Grace, there's a dinner night out on May the 1st. So, a dinner night out May the 1st at 6.30 at the China Grove Family House. So, please RSVP to Cindy Young if you're interested in that. And then lastly, uh, the Men's Fall Retreat is coming up. We keep you know, I've been joking that it's been on there, but now it's April, so it's actually right around the corner. Coming up in September, uh, first payment is due at $75 if you want to go, so please plan on getting that done by May the 25th. Uh, it's at Scott Kerr Lake again, which is where we are at last year, and it was awesome. Uh, so we would love to have you guys if you're, if you're interested in going. So on that note, we will go ahead and hand it off. Are we? Oh. We're shaking hands. I thought we were doing music next. <laughs> Greet your neighbors. Hello. Good morning.
right, the kids have something special for y'all today. If y'all watch them. <laughs> filled the sky the day that Jesus died in agony upon the bitter cross they took his body down and laid it in the tomb his friends believed that every sin was lost but when the third day news turned to life for Mary heard her name and saw the living Christ risen to set the captives free risen to ransom you and me to bind up every broken heart to conquer death Thank you. 
This is a story of a runaway, no way home and no way out. I threw the best of me away, I had my chance, it's too late now. Too far gone and too ashamed to think that you'd still know my name. But love refused to let my story in that way. You didn't wait for me. Cross that distance, even if I wanted to. You came running after me when anybody else would have turned and left me at my worst. Love will first. Oh, 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 oh. What kind of grace, relentless grace? Chases the rebel down, crawl into this prisoner's cage, take my hand and pull me out. You knew I couldn't make the change, so you became the change in me. And now I live to tell the story of the God who rescues. You didn't wait for me to find my cross that distance even if I wanted to you came running after me when anybody else would have turned and left me at my worst love moved from the throne to the major from a major to the grave your cross is the proof love made the first move from a grave meant to keep you to a stone road away. Your cross is the proof. Love made the first move. I remember where you found me. I'm amazed by where I stand. Your cross is the proof. Love made the first move. You didn't wait for me to 
find my way to you I couldn't cross that distance even if I wanted to you came running after me when anybody else would have turned and left me at my worst love moved All, there, 
All right. At this time, the preschoolers are dismissed to their classes, and if y'all would, please stand and sing with us. We've got a couple hymns, hymns before I uh, believe the message comes. Christ the King, the 
Let me welcome you again, this time with the microphone, and uh, welcome you to Grace Bible Church. It's a privilege to have you here with us today. It's a privilege to, uh, to worship with you, and uh, it was a privilege to hear uh, all those just different, very talented people um, just lead us in worship. It was a great, a great time of worship. We were reminded of some great truths about Jesus as we sang this morning. Today's message is from Luke chapter 24. I'd like to invite you to, you to take your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 24, to a very familiar passage, I think, for most people. Luke chapter 24, probably uh, is one of the top, you know, Easter passages. You know, it deals with the resurrection of Jesus. It's the last chapter in the, the gospel of Luke, and... Uh, it's chock full of just wonderful things. We could scratch and dig at so many different aspects of this. Uh, but if you've been with us the past few weeks or months, you know that we have uh, just really been teaching, learning extensively about the resurrection of Jesus. We have went through the Gospel of Matthew uh, and really unpacked the last several chapters as it related to Jesus' resurrection. I mean, it is only the single biggest event that has ever happened in the history of the universe. I mean, it is a big deal, and there's so much that could be said about it. Um, but today we're going to really approach this passage dealing with the resurrection of Jesus, uh, not ignoring the resurrection of Jesus, but maybe just sort of looking at it from a different aspect, a different angle today. Uh, and I'd like to read the first 10 verses or so with you, and uh, then we'll dig a little deeper. So if you'll take your Bibles, uh, chapter 24 of Luke, verse 1. Uh, we'll read. It says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, meaning the, the women, went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered uh, into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest, meaning the disciples. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them like an idle tale, like a story made up. It says they did not believe them, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves and went home marveling at what had happened. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the empty tomb, which has written all over it your love for us. It has promise. It has hope. The resurrection is the central, pivotal event in the, in the redemptive history of the Bible. Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you for these words that you have um, allowed to be written in our language that they might um, give us hope. Lord, we thank you for it today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, first day of the week, this was a Sunday morning. 
And we know today, Sunday morning, is Easter morning, Resurrection Sunday morning. But for these ladies headed to the tomb, it was just a regular old first day of the week. Nothing special, nothing unusual about that particular day other than it was the next day after the Sabbath when they were resting, they were taking a break. Uh, these ladies were headed to the tomb with spices to anoint Jesus' body, something they did for th three or four days after a loved one had passed. They would take aloes and spices and things, and they would go to the tomb typically, and they would uh, sort of in an effort to make that body, um, to pay reverence to the body and also to uh, sort of lessen the odors. And so they would do that. Typically, it was a very common thing. Well, the ladies have just had to take a day off for the Sabbath, and so now they're scrambling and they're hurryingly, uh, lovingly, with great intentions, headed really to the wrong spot. Jesus isn't there. And so they're headed there. They're with these spices. They're going to anoint the body of Jesus. But when they get there, it says they were perplexed. They're kind of like, whoa, what's up here? And there were three things that really caught them off guard. Number one, the stone was rolled away. It says uh, in other passages that uh, when Jesus was buried in that new, fresh tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, that they placed his body in the tomb and they rolled this ginormous stone the Bible doesn't say ginormous, but it was big. Okay. They rolled this big stone in there, and they sealed it. And also, a Roman guard was placed. Centurions were placed to guard this ginormous stone. And so they got there, and ladies got there thinking, okay, we're going to anoint the body. We're going to have to recruit some guys to help us move this stone out of the way. So they're perplexed. They get there. The stone's already been removed. Well, we didn't see that coming. But okay. So then the second thing they're perplexed about is they go in the open tomb and Jesus' body is not there. Okay, they totally did not see that coming. Why is his body not here? I mean, we have come for this purpose, to anoint his body, to put these aloes and things on his body. And like they went to some effort and some trouble, some expense, and a pretty good little hike you know, out of the city to go and to do this and like all of a sudden it's like man he's not even here what happened to his body and then thirdly it says the thing that they were perplexed by was the fact that there were these two men in dazzling apparel now that doesn't mean that they just went to Kohl's yesterday and sort of got some new threads because it's Easter no these were angels and it says men here but later on okay that was their their sort of thought. These, they look like people. But later on, it tells us that these were angels. These were angelic messengers. Angelos, which means messengers. That's what angels are. That's what they do. And they come th there to these per perplexed ladies with a question and then a couple follow-up statements. Very brief what these angels say, but very pointed, okay? very important, very significant. They ask the ladies, they say, why do you seek the living among the dead? And so what are, they, what, is the, what, is the, what are the angels saying here? They're saying to these, uh, these ladies who, who were very well known to Jesus, loved by Jesus. Jesus loved them. You know, they, I mean, they had this mutual affection. They've spent time together. These ladies are hardworking ladies. They're well-intentioned ladies. But the angel sort of says with this message from the Lord, kind of like, uh, why are you here? You're, you're, you're kind of in the wrong place. As well-intentioned as your efforts here might be this morning, uh, he's risen. And so they really begin to challenge those, these ladies' expectation and their understanding. See, the ladies were operating off of what they had seen not off of what Jesus had told them. Jesus had told them that he would be buried and he would, he would be crucified and buried and rise again on the third day. He had told them and he, had, he told the disciples. He'd said it and he'd said it and he'd said it. But yet here they are on this Sunday morning kind of barking up the wrong tree in a sense. You know, they have a saying in Spanish. I love this one. It says, um, kind of similar. It says, Al buen monte vas por leña. It's sort of a sarcastic way of saying, like, you, if you're looking for firewood, you have come to the wrong mountain. 
And these ladies were looking for Jesus in the wrong spot. And the angel says, why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is alive. He has risen. And then, very significantly, the angel says, remember how he told you. Oh, yeah. He did say that. You know, if only we had calendared that when he said that. You know, we have this thing, my wife and I, you know, we'll put things on the calendar, but then I forget to look at the calendar, right? <laughs> Gets me in trouble sometimes. I'm walking out the house with my cup of coffee, and I'm, yeah, I'm going on about my day, and my wife kind of looks at me like, and uh, that look as if, as if to say, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> have you not looked at the, today, you know, what's, you know, what's on the calendar? Okay, you need to get back in here, because, we, you know, we've got an appointment, or we've got this, or there's a ball game, or, you know, whatever, um, it was funny, you know, Riley has a tendency to say funny things, <clears throat> if you've been around him much. It was funny, uh, one, one day uh, we were getting ready to go out to eat, and it was cold outside, and um, it's kind of this running thing is that, you know, Lizzie wants to run off and go outside without a, a jacket, like it'd be 30 degrees outside, and she's, you know, got a t-shirt and shorts, and, and uh, Michelle's looking at her like, you know, you're crazy. And uh, so she says to Riley, she says, Riley says, what does Lizzie need right now? She's trying to get him to say it. And he goes, a hug? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's like, no, a jacket. <laughs> she needs a jacket. Um, but anyway, what does she need? A hug? I, I don't know. You know. Um, no, no, no. What does Lizzie look like right now? She's trying to get it, answer the question. What does Lizzie look like right now? She looks like she's ready to go out to eat with her family. <laughs> Oh, Lizzie needed to be reminded of the weather. Just go stand out on the porch for a couple minutes. Okay, we need reminders, right? We need to constantly be reminded. Hopefully, as we grow and mature in the faith, hopefully we remember to remind ourselves of what God says in His Word. We need to be reminded. We need to constantly be connected to the words of Jesus. Um, we need to be reminded, right here these ladies are being reminded, to, to, to think about, go back, what did Jesus say? Oh yeah, there was that thing that he said. Next passage says, that very day two of them, meaning the disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus. Here's two guys named Cleopas, we don't know the other one's name, but here are two guys that also need, guess what, a reminder and Jesus shows up to give them that reminder. It says, two of them were going to this village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about these things concerning Jesus, the crucifixion, the resurrection. It says, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're having with each other as you walk? It's like sort of a curious question for Jesus to ask. It says, they stood still looking sad. Now, why were they looking sad? Because they were walking as if Jesus were still in the grave. They were living their lives, they're going about their day as if Jesus were still dead. When, in fact, they had been told that he would rise from the dead. They'd been told, and they'd been told, and they'd been told... You know, ever since way back in, in, at Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus first told the disciples, he said, hey guys, I'm going to be crucified and buried and on the third day rise. And that was the time when Peter said, oh, no, 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 Lord, that'll never happen to you. And Jesus says the whole, you know, get behind me, Satan thing. You remember that? So Jesus has told them and he's told them and he's told them. And yet, here are these two disciples, and they're walking on Emmaus Road, and they're looking sad. Just like the ladies. The ladies were perplexed. This doesn't meet our expectations. There's something off here. There's something wrong. And these guys are looking sad because they thought that Jesus would be the one to deliver them, to overthrow the Romans, and to, to sit on the throne of David. And Well, it was a good run, but I guess that ship has sailed and that's not going to happen so they're sad they're disappointed they're discouraged so jesus says what is this conversation you're having holding with each other as you walk and one of them named cleopas answered him saying 
kind of sarcastically, he says, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? Like, can you be more clueless? Like, he says, and, and Jesus said to them, what things? I love this question. It's almost like Jesus has a little bit of a sense of humor here. Oh, really? What things? I mean, he's only been the center of everything that's happened. He's like, oh, tell me, what thing, what's happened? And, uh, but Jesus is drawing them out. He wants to know, Cleopas, what, what do you think? What's your take on all of this? And see, if we go back for a moment, it says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Why do you think it is that Jesus uh, was not recognized by them? You know, there's a lot of theories about that. Some people say, well, maybe Jesus was uh, scarred up or he'd been beaten so badly you know, when he was on the, on the cross and all of that that maybe he just wasn't quite recognizable to them. And um, I think, I mean, there may be some truth to that, but, but I think the text actually tells us why. Jesus did not want to be seen by them. In fact, later in this passage, when Jesus wants them to know who he is, he opens their eyes so that they can see him. But there's a reason why Jesus is, does not want to be seen by them visually, yet it's coming. But I think Jesus is really trying to draw them out. It's kind of like that episode of Undercover Boss, you know, where the boss of the company, you know, he or she puts on, you know, the scrubby clothes and they go down to the mail room and they, you know, pretend to be a regular employee and they kind of, you know, in that environment, they really get what people really think because these people are not going to put on a show for them. They're going to actually say, you know, well, that boss is a real jerk, you know, or whatever. You know, so Jesus is showing up, but he doesn't want them to know it's him yet because I think he really wants some insight into it. Cleopas, tell me. What do do you really think? Now, Cleopas is a disciple of Jesus, and if you had asked him a few days ago, who is Jesus? He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He is the, the Christ, the anointed one. But now Cleopas is looking sad and says, says, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and his people. Cleopas is backed it up he's dialing it way back because of what his eyes have seen he saw no doubt jesus die on the cross he saw the weeping he saw the soldiers he saw the crucifix he saw he saw them maybe even put jesus in the tomb cleopas is sad because he is operating off of what his eyes have seen not remembering how he told them Remember how he told you. Remember how he told you. Cleopas is struggling. The other disciples struggling. And so they they go through this spiel. They say, you know, well, Jesus, he was a prophet. And, you know, was past tense. Prophet, not Messiah, but now he's a prophet. I think that's why Jesus didn't want to be recognized by them yet. Because one, I think he wanted Cleopas' honest opinion. Cleopas, where are you really at? But it says, it goes on, Cleopas said, uh, you know, um, verse 21, we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel, had hoped, past tense. Yes, besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Cleopas has lost hope. It says, moreover, some of the women from our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels. You get the feeling that Cleopas believes this? Maybe not. It says, it says that, that, that some, of us, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Eh, I don't know. Cleopas, he's like, I just, I'm not sure. It was a good run with Jesus, but I think he probably was just a prophet. But then Jesus says in verse 25, in a similar fashion, I think, to remember the angel with the ladies? Why do you seek the living among the dead? Kind of like a gentle rebuke. Okay, now Jesus with these two guys, he, he ups it just a little bit. There's just a little, more, a little more bite to his rebuke here. He says, oh, foolish ones, and slow to believe all that the prophets have said. He kind of lets them have it a little bit here. 
slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know, that's curious when we think about that. Why would Jesus not have at that moment, instead of doing a Bible study, just have said, Cleopas, look, buddy, it's me. Why did, why did he not at that moment just sort of say, Cleopas, just look, buddy, it's me, I'm right here. And gives Cleopas sort of that visual confirmation. And I think it's really the, back to the reason why Jesus is, is, not, is not allowing himself to be seen to be spotted, identified here. One, I think he wants to draw out Cleopas' real opinion. But I think additionally, during these 40 days that Jesus is risen from the dead, yes, appearing to the disciples is important, but he's trying to wean them off of needing that visual, physical, tangible presence to moving toward a dependence upon what I have told you. Moving from visual to verbal. You see, in the coming days, these disciples would need to be comforted not by the physical presence of Jesus, but by remembering His words. And you and I today do not have physically, visibly, the presence of the Savior with us. Oh, He's with us, but not in this visual, tangible sort of way. And, and, and so what do we rely upon today? We're called to rely upon the Word of God. Remember how He told you. Go from visual to verbal. You know, many Christians today really, they just, I mean, it's just a part of a human, the human nature. We want visual. We want to see it. Give me a dream. Give me a vision. Give me a miracle. Jesus says, remember how I told you. Remember how I told you. It's the reason why in so many passages here, Jesus moving them from visual to verbal, he's saying, Thomas, Thomas, you know, who needed to see Jesus, said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know, in the book of uh, Romans and Hebrews, we see passages like, faith comes by not seeing, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. The book of Hebrews says that in these last days, God has spoken to us by His Son. Spoken. There's an emphasis on the verbal. Hebrews chapter 2 says we need to pay closer attention to what we have not seen, but heard, lest we drift away. Pay attention. Remember what I have told you. He's taking them and he's weaning them off, just like getting a baby off of a bottle and onto Gerber baby food. I hate that stuff. Oh, it's so gross. And moving them on to solid food. He's taking them from requiring the visual. Guys, I want to move you over here. Pay attention. Remember what I've said. And so we come to the last passage in this, in this chapter. It says, uh, but of course, Jesus, I'll just summarize here, but Jesus does reveal himself to Cleopas and the other disciple. You know, some commentators, some Bible scholars think that maybe the second guy with Cleopas may have been Luke. We don't know that, um, but this is recorded in more detail in the Gospel of Luke than anywhere else. But these two guys, whatever their names were, they sat down to break bread with Jesus. They invite him in. They go to break bread, and it's like all of a sudden they realize this is Jesus And then they reflect. They say, did not our hearts burn within us while he opened the Scriptures? You know, Jesus is moving them from visual to verbal. And they're like, oh, yeah. This guy talked like Jesus. This guy sounded like Jesus. This guy spoke with the truth of Jesus. You know what? I think it was Jesus. And it's it's like, oh, and then they get the visual confirmation. But he's moving them away from that. But then they run back to Jerusalem from, a, from, from Emmaus, seven miles. You can know these guys, they're hoofing it, right? They're, they're jogging, uh, and they're hoofing it back to Jerusalem. And it says they go to tell the rest of the disciples. It says, uh, and I believe this, we're down in um, uh, verse uh, 36. So they go back to Jerusalem. It says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. 
and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. So listen to the, these, these verses right here. Notice what they're relying on and notice where Jesus is moving them from the visual to the verbal. It says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took and ate it before them. So Jesus is giving them sort of this visible, physical confirmation that he's, I'm alive, I'm here. Touch me and see. I'm going to eat with you. Right? I'm not a spirit. But notice where Jesus takes them next in verse 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So he says, you're witnesses of these things. And it goes on. But Jesus, again, taking these guys from visual to verbal. So what happens is if you and I are not living constantly reminded, constantly being connected to what Jesus said, you know, there's a tendency for us to live the disconnected Christian life uh, like these guys and gals that we just read about. They're perplexed, they're sad, they're disappointed, they're going around without joy, without peace. Wrong expectations, they're barking up the wrong tree. And many Christians today live as if Jesus were still in the grave. Okay, they wouldn't say Jesus is still in the grave, but they live like he's not present, like he's not accessible he's not available he's not interested he has no input into how i live my life it's just me doing my own thing and he's not really present with me we're kind of like cleopas <laughs> we're just kind of going about doing our own thing and it's like jesus is right here and he's asking me these probing questions cleopas what are you doing buddy does that really what you think i mean he's he's, he's right there but I think many Christians would be embarrassed at what they were doing if they really realized that Jesus was right there with them in the moment. Living the forgetful Christian life is a danger. We need to constantly be connected, remembering how he told us. You know, Jesus has a lot of input into how we live our lives day to day. He is interested. He's available. He asks us those probing questions. And he has a lot to say on lots of different topics if we would seek his advice and live believing that he's alive. But speaking of remembering, so today we're going to do some remembering. We're going to do communion. Um, so in just a moment, we'll have, um, have our guys, we're going to do communion. And in a few moments, I'll have you come up if you desire to take communion. Uh, but communion is an opportunity to remember how he told you. Um, this is a great, great opportunity uh, to be reminded. And uh, when, we, when we do communion, we've got really two elements. We've got the bread and the cup. And, and we do communion for several reasons. Just going to kind of share them with you very briefly. When we do communion, we take the Lord's Supper, we are remembering his death. We're remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made. So when we take communion, the bread and the cup, we as Christians are saying through our actions, we're saying Jesus' death, his body that's, which was broken and his blood which was shed, as I take and eat those elements, I ingest those things, I'm saying that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross wasn't just a good idea for really bad people. 
Jesus' death and his sacrifice on the cross wasn't just for somebody else or for mankind in general. But when I take those elements and I take them in, I'm saying Jesus died for me. I was a sinner, separated from him, and I believe that through his sacrifice, not eating a piece of bread and drinking some grape juice, but through his sacrifice on the cross and through faith in what he did, I believe that I, as a sinner, am now reconciled to God. And so when I, say, when I take those things, I'm saying I believe that. It is a testimony. It is a witness. So that's one good reason. Another good reason is that, that we do communion is, is that Jesus commanded us to. He said, do this. Jesus said, do it. All right, I want to do it. All right? Jesus said, do this. As, as often as you do it, you remember my death until I come. So why do we do communion? It's a testimony. We're commanded to do it. And then there's a great benefit to it for us. Um, Not calorically, not uh, vitamin-wise, not anything like that, but the the benefit is in the reminder. So when, when we hold the bread in the cup, what we can reflect on, should reflect on, when I do that and I reflect on what Jesus did, it says something about who I am and who Jesus is. Think about this for a moment. Jesus died on the cross, God's only begotten Son, His unique one-of-a-kind Son. When Jesus died on the cross, you realize that was the single most costly transaction that has ever occurred in the history of the universe. To redeem you and me from an eternity separated from God. The cost of that, it wasn't a thousand dollars a person. It wasn't a million dollars a person. It wasn't a billion dollars per person. It wasn't even like approaching the the GDP of of a first world nation. The cost to redeem you and me from the penalty that our sin deserved was the costliest transaction that has ever occurred. That God sent his unique, one-of-a-kind son to die on the cross. There was not a higher cost that could have been paid. And that says something, both about me and about him. Sometimes we think our sin was just not that serious. It just is not that big of a deal. And God probably just, you know, it's just, you know, he could probably kind of overlook it if he wanted to. The cost that Jesus paid on the cross says otherwise. That I was so far from God that that nothing else would do, nothing less would do. Jesus asked the Father, will anything less do? Nothing less will do. The problem is that great. We are separated by sin from God. There is no way. There's no other price that can be paid other than this one. The cost of the transaction says something about the distance. But it also says something about the love of God, that He would pay any cost to have us reconciled to him any cost he did not withhold from us his only son and you know what that says about his love i can walk in that i can be reminded today that he who withheld not his only son from us how shall he not also along with christ freely give us all things there is nothing that god will not do for you If this is an example of his love, we're reminded as we take communion of that sacrifice. So it's a testimony. It's something we're commanded to do. It's a great reminder. And then lastly, it's also an opportunity for us to examine ourselves. Even as today, you know, we're talking about living the reminded life. We're talking about living our life, you know, remembering what Jesus said. You know, some of us are not living the reminded life. Sometimes some of us are living, um, and Jesus is, is, is with us, and he's kind of asking us those probing questions. Maybe today you've been living the forgetful Christian life. Maybe you've been out of fellowship with God. Uh, if I could say it a little bold, bolder than that. Maybe, maybe today you're living, doing something treating someone a certain way, going places you shouldn't go, doing things, setting things in front of your eyes that you shouldn't set in front of your eyes, whatever it may be, something that just is between you and God in that fellowship. 
communion is a great opportunity to confess that, to examine, just to say, you know, between you and God and the silence of your pew where you're sitting, as you get ready to take communion, maybe there's something that you should do business with God about and just say, you know what, you're right. God, you're right about that thing. I have been wrong. The Bible says when we confess our sins as believers, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, just like that. If we'll confess it. So communion is a great opportunity to do that. So as we get ready to come up today, if you need to do business with God, please, please do that. I want to invite you to do that. So um, at this time, so if you're with us today and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, We'd like to invite you to come and take communion with us. If you're a parent of a small child, a younger child, that can be at your discretion. If you if your if your child is professed faith in Jesus, if they want to come if you want to come with them and help them, that would be fine as well. So uh, I'd like to invite you to come up and uh, come on up left or right. Come take the elements, take them back to your seat, and we'll um, get ready to take communion together.
what I, <clears throat> what I should have said and I uh, forgot to say it, but if there's anybody that wasn't able to come up and get communion, you want to have it brought to you, we can do that. Is there anybody that didn't get it that still, okay, all right, I neglected that piece of information. All right, so this time we'll, we're going to participate in communion. I'm just going to read briefly the passage that goes with it from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11. Paul writes this, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's partake together. Let's pray, and then uh, we'll stand for a closing song. Lord, we do thank you today for your words, which bring life. Lord, may we remember, remember, remember how you told us. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for taking our penalty. Thank you for rising from the dead and giving us hope. Lord, we thank you for it. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to be together today. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll stand miss with a closing song. Stay.